So today's lecture is going to be centered around uh, this idea of a post and core and endodontically treated teeth. But before we dive into that subject, let's just first take a look at a typical life cycle of a tooth. So many times a tooth will start off with a small cavity, which then years later turns into a bigger cavity that requires a larger restoration. And eventually something like this will be undermined with caries again and um, oftentimes will be uh, resulting in a need for a root canal. So we hollow out the uh, nerves and the roots in the canal space and then in doing so a lot of times the caries has destroyed much of our tooth structure. So at this point we want to restore this tooth back to its uh, original form but we can see that there's not as much tooth for that crown to sit on. Basically, you've um, lost a lot of the natural retention resistance form that was provided by the natural tooth itself. So then the question is, well, um, can we build up that tooth uh, sufficiently for a crown to sit on? So if we were to look into this question of when does a tooth require a post, um, we can answer that by just looking at what the crown and the forces that crown would take uh, are subjected to um, in relation to our core buildup. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, if we were to look at a tooth and we can see that it doesn't have a lot of its natural tooth structure to help hold the core buildup together, then you would need a post. Okay, so let's look into this uh, idea and take a step back to the previous exercise that we did. Remember that amalgam core uh, buildup that we did? Well, one of the criteria was how many walls did we have remaining? And um, if we had a sufficient amount of walls, then we knew that this buildup material, in this case amalgam, would be re able to be retained within um, the tooth structure itself. So basically this you can see the amalgam is contained uh, within this um, tooth and it has sufficient opposing walls here to prevent the dislodgement of this amalgam. So not only having the walls but also having the chamber there helps keep this amalgam in place. So going back to that question um, of when we need a post, well a post should only be considered when other forms of retention are inadequate. So remember when we talk about retention we're specifically talking about the core buildup material that we're trying to add or build that tooth back up to. So remember the uh, scenario that we're trying to paint is that by the time you do a root canal most likely um, a good chunk of your natural tooth structure has been broken down already and needs to be replaced. Okay. Um, so just to finish up that point, notice the amalgam in that core uh, scenario penetrates down into that chamber and then uses the uh, existing walls also to help hold that into place. So when we don't have an opportunity to be able to engage all those walls in the chamber, uh, we're going to have to look to a different method of holding that core buildup material in place. So these, uh, pic this picture here is um, an example of a situation in which the wall structure or the natural tooth structure is insufficient for holding uh, something like an amalgam core buildup. So um, how can we get the core to stay on and be held onto this tooth? Well that's where this idea of a post and core comes in. Okay. So um, here's just another view of a typical example where you can see the tooth is so badly broken down that it doesn't have a lot of its natural tooth structure to hold this um, core buildup in. So even if we uh, assume that this is a composite buildup, one would argue that, well, couldn't we just bond this composite into these walls here and have that composite hold on to that tooth structure? So um, what you need to think about though is if we were to bond composite to that, the majority of that bond to composite is to the dentin structure. 
which is significantly weaker than a bond to enamel. So over time, after you load this tooth, you know, imagine you're um, chewing, you know, every day on this, and you're cyclically loading this tooth. Eventually, that bond between the dentin and the tooth structure is going to be compromised. So we actually need something that is um, needs some adjunctive procedure. Uh, to help retain this core buildup from getting dislodged, okay? Um, so that's where a post would come in, um, and this would aid in the retention of this core buildup um, as, of course, it's going under this cyclic loading. So we want that core buildup to be able to be retained within the tooth structure adequately um, for the long term. Okay, so just to summarize, the purpose of the post is to retain the core buildup, uh, and a post does not reinforce the hauled out tooth. In fact, it decreases its strength and makes it more susceptible to fracture because a post acts like a lever arm. So this idea of a post acting like a lever arm, we're going to re uh, revisit that uh, towards the end of the lecture. Um, but basically, anytime you put a post in here, um, it's they used to think that that post would help strengthen the tooth by reinforcing it, but really it just acts to weaken it a bit because uh, we're drilling to make that post space and actually acts as a lever arm. But we're balancing that out with the idea that this post is necessary for the sake of holding this buildup um, in, in place. Okay. So um, when we drill the post space, uh, we generally use a parallel sided uh, drill. So this will uh, create the post space for us. And one of the criteria that we're looking for is that we want that post to be about two thirds the length of the root. So this is a clinical guideline, not a hard and fast rule. And then the other aspect is we want at least a five millimeter uh, seal of gutta percha to maintain the integrity of that root canal. Um, so you can see we'll perform the root canal, you want to drill your post space, and then the post is going to be the same diameter of that post drill that you used, and then you want to leave um, about five millimeters of gutta percha, and then as a guideline you want to uh, have that post about two-thirds the length of the root. Of course there's other clinical considerations to take into account, such as the root curvature because obviously you don't want to perforate um, through uh, a root. Okay, So you will place, uh, drill the post space, cement the post in so that it's attached to the tooth, and then we're going to add our core buildup material to build up that uh, crown prep into the ideal shape that we want. So again, the sequence is drill post space, cement post, and then attach the um, or bond um, the core buildup material to that post. And if you look at these posts and the, the way that they're designed, what I want to draw your attention to is these retentive features within the post system. So a lot of these will have a macro uh, retentive feature that the core buildup can um, adhere to and lock into. To, to connect the post to the core buildup. The important factor about this is that you want to keep that retentive element within the core buildup itself. You don't want any of this sticking through or at the junction here where it's exposed to the outside environment. And the reason for that is you don't want um, that interface to be exposed because that can be an area in which bacteria can leak through and then compromise the integrity of your root canal. So um, before we cement it, what we do is uh, adjust the uh, post length to the appropriate length so that this retentive feature is embedded within the core buildup itself. So we would cut the post from this end to the appropriate length that we need. So let's get into the different type of posts that we have. The first, uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is a fiber post. Um, and the fiber posts are nice because of the aesthetics of it. So these fiber posts are often uh, tooth colored. Um, they're either maybe clear or white. And the nice thing about that is that it'll blend in with the natural tooth pretty well. 
Um, the other aspect that I want to point to is the fact that um, it contains resin, which means that um, you can bond to it. So you can adhesively bond to this post because it has a resin component to it. Um, so going back to this idea of aesthetics, uh, you can see from this picture, we have a picture of a tooth that has a metal post. And then to the right, this is um, a tooth using a uh, fiber uh, post that's tooth colored. And you can see that the metal post um, has some darkness to it and that can shine through uh, in certain uh, teeth. So especially when you're working in the anterior where the aesthetics of the crown is important, um, a fiber post is preferred due to the aesthetics um, and its ability to be bonded in using a resin cement. So this is contrasted with a metal post. So you can see here that this is a metal post that they really they need to opaque um, to block out the metal. So that's another way to get around the uh, color or the mismatching color of the post. Um, but the advantage is that it's pretty low, low cost. So a metal post is a lot cheaper to use than a fiber post. Um, but you have some sort of aesthetic compromise. The other downside is you're solely relying on mechanical retention to keep that post uh, within the uh, canal space. So you can see that there's serrations along this post that the cement will find its way into in order to lock in uh, to that post space. All right, so something that you'll see um, but not use uh, anymore is this idea of an active post. So in the past, uh, what they thought was the active post has the best form of retention. So if you can thread this post into the tooth, then it's going to be really hard for that post and cord to be dislodged because it's sort of locked in there. Um, but really what happened is those threads end up compromising the integrity of the tooth. So each of these little thread portions acts as an area of stress concentration uh, which puts a lot of stress on the tooth and then we found that uh, these tended to fracture. Um, the other thing too is these are very hard to retrieve if you ever need to do a retreatment of that root canal. Um, so these active posts um, were thought, I mean they do have the best retention but are no longer indicated anymore uh, because of the high risk of tooth fracture. Um, so we've moved on to these parallel parallel side post where the uh, post drill is the same width as this um, uh, post and the idea is that the uh, walls of this post sort of passively engage the canal space in order to minimize the stress onto the tooth. Okay and the last uh, post that we're going to talk about is this idea of a cast post core. So all the other ones that we've talked about prior were prefabricated uh, posts that had sort of just a generic um, straight walled um, shape to it. Okay, So with a cast post, uh, the idea here is that we wanted to customize a post that is going to fit into the exact contour of that canal space. So what you would do is you would start off um, with um, sort of a generic post space, okay, and then around it you would add, um, in this case it's an acrylic resin, so the red stuff that's added onto this plastic uh, post is acrylic resin that's going to fill in the exact shape of that canal. So once you've essentially made a mold or impression of what that looks like using this uh, red acrylic, um, you can then go through the casting process. So you would follow the same casting process as you made like a gold crown. So you would invest this material. This would actually burn out. So the resin and plastic is able to be burnt out at that high temperature. And then you would sling or cast uh, metal into that space. And then you would end up with a custom or a cast post and core where the post and the core are all one unit, okay? So it's one homogenous um, 
cast post core, and this gets cemented into the canal space. Okay, um, these cast post cores are not utilized readily anymore. Uh, one because of the labor-intensive process um, of uh, making the impression and doing the casting, um, and the other is that we found that the um, cast is, although it's well adapted to the canal space, meaning it perfectly fits into that canal space, it actually puts on a lot of um, unneeded stress onto the tooth because the whole length of that post is engaged along the walls all the way down. Whereas when you use a prefabricated post that's parallel sided, um, you don't have the whole length necessarily of that tooth um, binding against the post. Generally it's going to be just the apical portion of that post engaging whereas the cast post and core the whole length of it is tightly bound. Uh, so remember we said that the post can act like a lever arm and induce a lot of stress um, so this became very problematic at times. Okay, So these aren't as widely used anymore. So let's get into this idea of post length, right? The question is, well, how long do we want our posts to be? And these are the general guidelines that we've given you about, uh, you want five millimeters of gutter percha at the apex to maintain a seal, about two thirds the length of the root, uh, a minimum of one to one uh, crown height to post length ratio. So you can see that this post uh, exceeds that. This is taller than what the crown height would be. And the last part, uh, which is pretty important, is this idea that you keep that post length short of where that curvature is. So remember this post, these are going to be straight posts, and it won't be able to curve around. So if you took this post any deeper, you're going to be out the side of the root. Okay, so those are the criteria. And then the last criteria is, well, how wide do we want the post? Um, and the main principle here is the post diameter should be kept at a minimum. Uh, the ideal drill diameter is just large enough to remove the gutta percha. So ideally you want that um, post width to be about the same width of that canal space that you had um, instrumented when you cleaned and shaped it. You don't want to unnecessarily remove more width. Uh, that's needed. So just enough to remove the gutta percha and then barely engage the walls of the tooth. All right, so let's go through this um, clinic example that we saw in our clinic just to set up this idea of feral effect. So this patient came in, we had seated a three unit bridge for the patient and one of the teeth had been root, root canal treated and she com came in with a complaint of my bridge is loose. So when we went back and looked at the original radiographs of the root canal that was done years ago, what we found was the tooth was actually at the same level or the height of where the gums are. So if we were to draw a line, and it's a little faint on this radiograph, but where I draw the red line is the height of the free gingival margin, we can see that the tooth structure is essentially flush with that. So in a clinical picture, you can see on the facial aspect, uh, the tooth structure is flush with the um, gingival margin. If we took a probe, we can see that on the lingual, it's a very short wall height, probably less than a millimeter and a half. Okay. Um, so when we take a picture of the uh, tooth, we can see that the post and the core build up um, was just left intact in the um, crown. So we know that the weak link of this whole complex was actually the connection between the post and the tooth. Okay. So that kind of sets, it, sets us up for um, this example that I just want to show to clarify or make uh, clear this point is I have a tooth that is uh, of varying tooth heights. So one is cut off at the gum line and then this has a millimeter tall natural tooth structure wall and then this is a little taller at two millimeters. So we ask the question, well, which scenario is more favorable? So if we were to add a post and core to all these, well, it's pretty obvious to see that, of course, the scenario that you had in which you had the tallest natural 
tooth axial wall is probably going to be the best um, outcome for us. So if we were to look at this uh, example, you would see that you'd much prefer to have a situation in which your crown, in which your crown is engaging at least part of the natural tooth along the axial wall. So you can think of this crown as almost binding or pinching um, against the natural tooth structure uh, to help hold it together. Uh, and it's got something solid, at least on the lower portion of the crown, to resist, it, to resist any movement. Whereas if the crown build up or the, sorry, the post and core buildup is flush with the margin, this crown has nothing really to hug or bind against, okay? So just pay attention to this wall height. So when we talk about ferrule, what we're referring to is the height of this natural tooth structure uh, from the margin, the crown margin, to where your uh, post or post and core essentially starts. So this height here is what we refer to as the ferrule of a tooth. Okay. Um, so let's read this definition real quick. Um, so the ferrule is formed by the walls and the margins of the crown encasing at least two millimeters of sound tooth structure. Um, so the idea of having a ferrule is that it significantly reduces the incidence of fracture in endodontically treated teeth. Okay. So um, again, just to emphasize this point, when we talk about ferrule, it's how much tooth structure or height of this tooth structure do you have before the core buildup starts. Okay. Um, so we want a decent ferrule because um, it helps prevent this idea of fatigue failure. So structures subjected to low but repeated forces can appear to fracture suddenly for no apparent reason. And this is known as fatigue factor. So think about all the times when you're chewing, um, you're constantly loading your teeth over and over again, and you're subjecting it to um, cyclic loading. Okay, So this would initiate some cracks uh, and eventually potentially would lead to some sort of catastrophic uh, failure. Okay. So what we see here is that the repeated loading of it um, ends up transmitting some of the force towards the apex of this post, because remember, this post here can act like a lever arm. Okay, So mechanical loading will favor the propagation of microcracks that will progress from the coronal to the apical region of the tooth. So this fatigue failure uh, with the post um, is more catastrophic because it may result in the complete fracture of the root. So if you stress this part of it, especially as it gets thin, if you stress this enough, this has a potential to fracture the tooth itself, or it, you may end up losing the cement seal of the post, and that is going to become loose, just like we saw in our clinic example where the patient came in with the whole crown and post um, in her hand and the weak link between that was actually the post and the natural tooth. Okay, So that ferrule, the idea of the ferrule is that obviously if you have some heights of tooth structure that the crown can kind of bind to and help resist these uh, fatigue forces or lateral forces, um, then you're going to minimize the chance of overloading this uh, or losing um, your cement seal. Okay, so the question is, well, how tall do we want that tooth structure to be? So um, let's look at some studies that kind of um, explore that idea. So we have a control tooth here that is just a tooth that's completely intact that we have a crown uh, made for. And then they had four other groups of varying feral heights. So it goes from half a millimeter, one, 1 1.5, and two. And all these scenarios have that uh, post and core scenario um, with a crown built on top. Okay, so you can see how this is a two millimeter ferrule. Remember that natural tooth height on that axial wall versus something like this, where that is only about half a millimeter. Okay, so they went through and they cyclically loaded these teeth um, with a machine that was loaded at 135 degrees along the long axis, and they did this in a water bath. 
um, to simulate the oral environment. And they loaded these until they um, found failure. So these were cycles to failure. And this is the control. So this is sort of the ideal or maximum amount of uh, cycles. Um, so that's at about 100,000. And you can see that there's a significant difference once you uh, get past this um, 1.5 or uh, yeah 1.5 threshold okay um, so anything above that you can see that the tooth survived for a fairly long time okay so we kind of just rounded it up when we said that two millimeter ferrule is sort of our ideal or minimum that we want to go uh, get to so the two millimeters of axial natural axial wall height when you have a post and core situation um, is what we need for optimum success of that situation. Uh, the other thing you kind of want to look at too is, well, which, if you were to compromise this idea of a ferrule, um, well, which wall is the most important to have intact, right? So they did another study where um, they had the ferrule, but um, they only had it on certain aspects of the teeth. So they had it just in the palatal half, the facial half and then the proximal and then they this is a scenario in which there was no ferrule at all and then they loaded these maxillary anterior teeth and then they found that if you were to have at least um, one wall intact the most important wall is going to be the palatal wall so if you look at the median failure load the palatal the presence of a palatal ferrule um, gave you the highest failure load Okay, and that becomes pretty obvious in, when looking at the orientation of the teeth. So this study that they did was actually on maxillary anterior teeth. And if you look at the way that a maxillary anterior tooth is loaded, right, this lower tooth is going to hit the palatal side of this tooth, which is going to cause a tipping motion and kind of wants to dislodge this tooth in this direction, meaning that, or which leads to this idea that having a palatal ferrule of at least two millimeters is the most critical wall uh, to have. And obviously, if you are looking at a lower tooth or a posterior tooth, um, it's going to be uh, a little different scenario because the forces uh, generated move in a slightly different direction. Okay, so this study was specifically for uh, maxillary anterior teeth. Okay, so let's summarize this concept. Um, so in summary, the ferrule provides resistance to tooth fracture, while the post provides retention of the core. So this is an important uh, key thing to remember is that the term ferrule only applies to scenarios that involve root canal treated teeth that involve a post and core. Okay, um, so just a point of clarification and I'm gonna repeat this again only in situations that involve a post and core is when that term feral applies. Don't confuse this with this idea of retention form, um, or sorry, resistance form. So resistance form describes a height and taper of a crown preparation that prevents the crown from dislodging in a tipping motion. So remember this idea of a core, uh, amalgam core sorry, a chamber retained amalgam core buildup, okay? So in this situation, the tooth is root canal treated, but it doesn't actually have a post that acts like a lever arm going into the tooth. So in this scenario, we don't have two millimeters of that natural axial wall height, but that's not, in other words, feral, um, but that's not important in this case because this has no post in it. So in this specific example, uh, a ferrule would not apply to this situation because this lacks a post. Okay, so just make sure you understand that clarification. Ferrule only applies to scenarios that involve root canal treated teeth with a post and core. So let's quickly run through um, this idea of, well, how can we gain adequate tooth structure? Let's say your tooth doesn't have enough natural tooth height for that ferrule, and we want to gain that ferrule. So the two options we have are crown lengthening and orthodontic extrusion. And we've talked about a couple of these, or both of these um, principles in when we talk about 
biologic with. So I'll very quickly run through these examples and um, the question we have is well which procedure is going to be more favorable when it comes to the crown to root ratio. So if we started with the tooth and we'll just put some arbitrary numbers here so we'll say the crown height is 6 and the root length is 12. If we chose to crown lengthen let's say 3 millimeters so, well, before we do that, let me just paint this picture. Pretend our tooth has been fractured off and we don't have enough ferrule. So we want to gain a taller natural tooth height for a ferrule effect. So we can do that by crown lengthening, which means we just remove some of the bone surrounding it. And then we'll re-prep it and then we'll make our crown. So if we crown lengthen, um, let's just arbitrarily say by three millimeters, then that new tooth height or the crown height would be nine millimeters and then your root would be uh, nine as well. Okay. Um, in the same scenario we had a tooth but that was fractured off and then we want to gain more ferrule. The alternative would be to extrude that tooth. So we're going to pull that tooth down until we gain more axial wall height for our ferrule. And we go ahead and prep that and we want to keep that incisal edge length the same. So now our crown height is still going to be the six millimeters that we originally had. But since we drag the tooth down by three millimeters, the tooth root is going to be nine millimeters. So if we were to run through our calculations, we would see that our crown root ratio would be 0.5 um, for that original example. It would be one for that. Um, crown lengthening and then we would have two-thirds um, for the orthodontic extrusion meaning that this would give you a more favorable crown to root ratio um, for orthodontic extrusion okay but again there's advantages disadvantages for each the ortho extrusion obviously takes a little bit more time um, so you can see here, this is the example of ortho extrusion where this is cut off at the gum line and we put a post in here and we want to be able to build this tooth up and put a crown on it, but we don't have enough ferrule. So what we do is um, we do just a composite buildup. We attach brackets to it and then using these wires, we can slowly extrude the tooth to gain the adequate tooth structure that we need um, for that ferrule effect. Um, the alternative again is crown lengthening which just means that we're peeling the gums back and we're starting to remove the bony support um, around the tooth to make this tooth longer okay so that's what we call it crown lengthening um, so let's just quickly revisit this um, idea of biologic width so we know that it's made up of connective tissue and junctional epithelium and then um, the sulcus depth um, is lies above that okay so each is about a millimeter in uh, height so our biologic width for an average person is about two millimeters with about a millimeter sulcus depth so if we had that situation where a tooth was fractured off the off at the gum line the question we would need to tell our um, surgical colleagues is well we need to tell them how much tooth do we need to expose or in other words another way to think about it is you want to communicate the amount of bone that the surgeon needs to remove for you to gain your adequate tooth structure that you need so let's do a little math and we want to find out how much tooth or how much bone would need to be removed uh, in order for us to get adequate uh, ferrule okay so we know that the first layer is going to be connective tissue that's about a millimeter junction epithelium another millimeter sulcus is going to be a mil millimeter and then our ferrule we want a minimum of two so from the uh, top of your um, natural tooth structure to your bone you want at least five millimeters of distance okay three millimeters is going to be taken up of your uh, sulcus and biologic width and this is where your proposed margin would probably be and then you want at least two millimeters of natural tooth height above the margin for your ferrule. Okay so the two things that you really need to take into consideration 
when talking about crown lengthening is the root taper and the root trunk length. So these are critical things to think about because if you think about a tooth that starts to taper down, as you remove bone, guess what's going to happen to the width of your tooth? It's going to get really narrow and you may compromise um, the mobility of the tooth, meaning that if you take enough of the tooth away of a tapered root, then you obviously have much less surface area of PDL to help resist those forces. Or if you add something nice and thick all the way down, well, you can probably crown lengthen this pretty comfortably and not worry about excess mobility. So in posterior teeth, what you're looking at is um, the root trunk length. So the distance between um, where your CJ is and then your the start of the verification. So here we have adequate root, root trunk length where if we crown lengthen and lower the bone, we wouldn't have this frication exposed. Whereas if you look at um, diagram D, you can see that we don't have really any space for us to lower the bone because if we do, we're going to expose that frication that is very challenging to clean and then you're going to compromise the health of that tooth. Okay, So important factors to keep in mind when crown lengthening is root, ta root taper for anterior teeth and root trunk length for your posterior teeth. All right, so let's finish up with um, just a series of studies, and um, we're going to have a few clinical questions, uh, the first of which is, do you have to crown a tooth that has been root canal treated? Okay, so uh, um, Dr. Sorensen did a um, pretty extensive study in, in the sense that they looked at 6,000 patients from nine dental offices uh, which were endodontically treated. Um, so that's a large sample size. And the um, graph that I want to point you to is this that describes, um, or that's broken down the teeth uh, first into maxillary versus mandibular, and then they further broke down into anterior teeth, and then premolars and molars. Okay. Uh, the column that I want to first draw your attention to is this success or failure rate of teeth, of root canal treated teeth that were either crowned or not crowned. Okay. So let me summarize this chart for you. Um, really what I want to point you to is if you were to look at um, the anterior teeth, no matter if they're maxillae or mandibular, there's not a big difference between the success rate of a tooth of an endodontically treated tooth if it had been crowned or not crowned. So no significant difference. So maxillary anterior teeth it was about 88% successful and with a crown and with no crown is about 85%. But if you look at all the other categories, basically any posterior tooth, maxillary, maxillary and mandibular, you see a significant difference between the success rate. So 94% of these teeth um, that had a crown um, was uh, successful, meaning it didn't um, fracture or was lost, whereas 56% um, of the endodontically treated posterior teeth that didn't have a crown led to some adverse outcome, okay, uh, or sorry, um, survived, meaning that 44% led to some sort of adverse outcome. Okay, so to summarize, the idea is that coronal coverage of anterior teeth did not significantly improve the rate of clinical success. Um, so the principle that we try to follow is any posterior teeth that has had a root canal requires a crown in order to uh, protect the tooth and uh, for the longevity of it because we've hollowed out the tooth and compromised the tooth structure. Whereas anterior teeth, even if you root canal treat it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to crown the tooth uh, to protect it. If the access is conservative enough, then you can get away with just putting a regular filling to cover up that hole. Okay. Um, and then the last part of that um, study was the other column here. And they were trying to answer the question, does, a post, does the addition of a post reinforce the tooth? or strengthen it. And their conclusion with that is that, that it doesn't. Okay, So there's no significant increase in the resistance to fracture or dislodgement 
uh, gain with intracoronal reinforcement. So that term there just means post for the six anatomic groups of teeth. Okay. Um, so again, just the last couple slides here to summarize what's the purpose of the post. It's to retain the core buildup. The post does not reinforce the tooth. In fact, it decreases its strength because remember the post will act like a lever arm. And what is a ferrule? Well, we need two millimeters of natural uh, tooth height on the axial wall to resist these lateral forces, um, which typically lead to uh, either tooth fracture or a loose post.